Welcome to the Markcast, take three. Yeah, it's our big preview show. We're rolling this out right before the game. It starts about 6.30 p.m. So we, we appreciate you joining us, getting getting you ready for the game. Uh, Reed is in majestic Hawaii right now. Um, the reflection of the pool behind his window with a no smoking sign over his shoulder. Reed, how's it going out there? Uh, Aloha, Paul. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm, I'm doing great now that I've got everything figured out technically over here. You know, because we've had it, we did a live show last week and Reed's on vacation this week. So I'm having a little bit, you know, I'm doing a little bit more of the work than, than I normally do. So I'm just trying to make sure everything is okay because Reed has a some tremendous case of OCD. So I don't want to like, you know, I don't want to screw anything up. Yeah, Paul's Paul's uh, piloting the ship today. Paul's going to upload the video to YouTube. Uh, this is definitely more of the background I was hoping for when I talked with Dave Naylor at five in the morning. It was a little bit of a black hole when we did that. Dave is obviously East Coast, you know, Eastern time zone. And so we had to do 11 a.m. his time, 5 a.m. here. But uh, it definitely went, went more what I was hoping for now with the view than we had with Dave. And, and you'll see the interview. I'm, I'm in a little bit of a black hole at 5 a.m. talking to Dave, Dave Naylor about CFL. But we're glad we could get Dave on. You were in a little bit of a black hole. Did you miss your TV news days where you had to put a reporter into a black hole for a live shot that might not need a live shot? Yeah, Stop I was like trying to set up my iPad as like a key light and whatever. And I just figured we're gonna we're gonna roll with it. I, yeah, I was hot spotting on the on the iPhone. The the Wi Fi here isn't great. The hotspot I brought that I live stream with isn't great. So we are on the T Mobile uh, hotspot right now for my phone. So, uh, but it, it seemed good for Dave. I was gonna be so embarrassed if you know CFL Insider Dave Naylor came on and my internet didn't work. So. It looks it looks good when I'm when it's coming in. It looks like crystal clear right now coming into me. So uh, let's hope it stays that way going forward um i, I, I now I, you you talked talked about this when we had a little bit of a technical issue before That's okay uh but you switched teams yeah so uh we th there's been a little bit of uh intrigue on uh twitter this week uh we i i, I posted this week i said because i've been sitting here in hawaii you know we've had a lot of pool time a lot of reflection time i said you know i've really been reevaluating my life decisions and the only thing that the elks have done since i've become a fan is they upset derek dennis friend of the show derek dennis you know cfl NFL all-star uh, they have disparaged the XFL and they lost to the Red Blacks. And I said, I mean, what, you know, what am I doing? And so, uh, you know, friend of the show, Jim Mullen, uh, we have a, a Jersey coming your way from your team, the Argos, which I'm very, um, would feel very good about if I were you right now with McLeod Bethel Thompson, we'll get into that, why he's the king of the, of the CFL. But uh, I said, you know, I, I need a Jersey. They're still only selling the Eskimos jerseys. I didn't feel good supporting that either. So I think I'm switching teams. I'm, I'm switching it up ball. Do I have to blank out the word, the E word that you just said, do I have to blank it out now that that word's <laughs> yeah, canceled? Yeah, do, we have to, yeah. do I have to cancel that word out? Of, like, do I have to, do I have to treat you like will on will house now? Is that what happens? I have to blank out words that are canceled <laughs> because I don't want but, you to be canceled. <laughs> I don't you think that's interesting though. So you know, friend of the show William, you know, he's sending you a jersey. It should, it's in rude. That's it should be cool. here. And then he was going to send me one. And he goes, you know, I called the Edmonton store, and they're they're not even selling Elks jerseys till they get rid of all the old ones. And I thought, huh. So they canceled the name, and then they're just like, we're just going to sell the the old jerseys with the name on it anyway. And then you know, eventually, or are you talking about just the Edmonton football team jerseys? No, the ones it says Eskimos on it that that you couldn't have. It said blah, 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 on it. You can you can have it. You can yeah. You can't even get the Edmonton one right now. They all say Eskimos. Man, that's three now. <laughs> Thanks, Reed. Oh. Uh, but so no, but but speaking of this is a, another thing, and that this came in ahead of time. But we have a new review yes. from BC Lions fan on um, Apple Podcast Canada. I asked, I I tweeted at Jim Mullen. I said, Jim Mullen, that you? He said it's not. So we actually have more than one BC Lions fan. Do you want to read the review, Paul? Yeah, uh, we we got told this is the greatest show ever. Um, do you love crazy Canadian footballs when it, football? Crazy Canadian rules. Use your use your uh, reading skills, Paul. Do you <laughs> love crazy Canadian rules when it comes to football? Does hearing about spring leagues that have trouble getting off the ground turn your crank? Uh, I don't know about turning my crank. If you said yes, then this is the place for you. Come join the best pro football duo in podcast history. Wow, what a compliment. And be amazed at the amount of highly informative guests that interact with them. And, of course, the guests are really, I think, that has been driving the show immensely the last, you know, the last two, three, four months. And all credit due to Reed for going out and grabbing those guys because, 
man, it's been it's been great to hear from you got Dave Naylor coming up, uh, Farhan. Um, we've had, you know, Jim Mullen, Jim Mullen, uh, Rod Peterson, like so many great guests. And then there's a rush. And it's been cool that, uh, you know, that we, we that we focus on, you know, that 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 part in that review where it's like the the amount of highly informative guests that interact with them. That's uh, that's been the the driving force behind this. So, again, we want to thank all of our guests and Dave Naylor's coming up. Of course, we wanted Dave on for a while now, but we wanted to kind of um, in, in the radio industry, in the in the in the music radio industry, we call a term burn. Um, if you're tired of hearing a song, it's burned and there's a burn factor to that. And Dave was getting around a lot of podcasts. We kind of wanted to be like, well, you know, the burn is high right now. We want to kind of give him get, get him on here when it's fresh and it's, you know, oh, yeah, Dave Naylor. That's great. So that's what Reed did. Reed went out and reached out to him. And yeah. Yeah, Dave's great. We did the whole kind of post show about last week, everything that happened, thoughts on the games, thoughts, uh, compelling, super compelling with the Lions, you know, game uh, with uh, Michael Riley and all that. We get into the injury reports and, and sports betting and all that. Uh, Dave gives his thoughts about the attendance and the TV numbers, which we're going to go through here. And then obviously we preview all the games. So I thought we'll kind of do our stuff now. We'll plug Dave in. It's about 40 minutes with Dave and then we'll do some stuff. And then this is going to premiere on YouTube right now. So I'll be in the chat and stuff answering questions. So I thought that that was kind of a cool way with the time zones and it's six hours, all the different stuff going on, yeah. with, you know, for us still to be able to kind of do a, a pregame show this week. But I will say, Paul, that Dave said, yeah, he has been keeping an eye on us from a distance. And so I think we need to make a new shirt that says uh, Dave Naylor listens to the Mark cast. So. We'll get we'll get on that. Definitely. And uh, the reason why we're not doing this live live um, is because of some scheduling conflicts. I just got back from uh, covering a fire up yeah. in uh, Northern California, the Dixie fire, which is now the state's biggest fire. And, um, speaking of which, um, I'm getting a phone call. That's the reason why. I, well, that's the reason why we're not doing it live because I I have to spend time with my girlfriend. That's right. Yeah, it's okay. Congratulations, Paul, and that was all very excited for you to be using that term now. That that's a big that's a big step. I, it's a big step to to use that term. Like put that term on somebody. So. There you go. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so the episode title today is called McCobb Bethel Thompson, King of the CFL. And I want to crown him, your Argos lead quarterback right now, as the king of the CFL. We we covered, we're going to get into it in the show here. Uh, uh, immense Wikipedia that Mr. Bethel Thompson has. But, uh, you know, we, we've covered him from the Spring League. I know he was in the CFL before. A real journeyman. So, so that is the episode today. I'm going to crown uh, McLeod as the king of the CFL. Paul, what do you think about that? I like that idea because, you know, everybody had the, uh, the Argos written off last week like there's you know the Argos are just finding out who their players are and guess what Reed and I picked the Argos to win and they won so so there Calgary <laughs> that reminds me I need to enter my CFL fantasy picks when we get off here yes. before the game so do uh, Paul do you do we have any other I have a couple thoughts here about the games and everything from last week did you watch any of the other games besides the big opener um, um I'm trying to think <sighs> which one did I watch it wasn't the the Argos, man. It's it's escaping me right now. So I will say this. So I turned on social media. You know, we watched uh, Friday night. I think Dorothy and I were out uh, watching the BC Lions Rough Riders game. I, I texted Jim Mullen about this. I said. Uh, this is one of the most compelling things I've ever seen on the football field. Just uh, truly fun. And, and I know we've been, you know, football lacking and it's preseason and it was, you know, what do we have the hall of fame game with the Cowboys and the Steelers, or whatever, but uh, you know, Michael Riley, you know, he wasn't going to play or he was going to play. He got pulled. He, he was injured. The coaches, you know, Dickinson didn't, or, uh, the coaches didn't even know what was going on. You know, they, they put him in at halftime. He's like, heaving the rock down the field players like he's hitting his targets but players are having to like drop back down to catch the passes i mean it was just remarkable they came with the one score at the end if they hadn't have had uh points left on the field with their field goal kicker uh they probably would have won the game truly truly phenomenal heart and another reason why i'm with the lions so very cool stuff um are you are you adjusting three down football yet or is it still yeah, you know, I that, that that goes into that. You know, we watched the Elks Red Blacks game. Uh, That's the one that I was that was a bit of a slog. I texted Jim again, a message, and I said, uh, "This is when I I hear people say, oh, you know, three down football.' Like CFL is either the most exciting game or it is a little bit of a slog.' And I mean, you could say that with the NFL as well, but mm -hmm. it is hard when you're when you don't have momentum on your side. The three downs really seems to stifle that a little bit. Yeah, it's like that. That's what I told you. I'm like, it's hard to get momentum going when you're like 
two and out, two and out, two and out, two and out, two and out. Like that's really hard to get some kind of momentum. And um, yeah, if, if you're not scoring a lot of points, it does seem like a slog. It's like sometimes when they put, you know, three and 10 teams on Monday night football, you're like, well, this is the marquee Monday night game. And we got crappy teams on it. Like oh, who wants to watch this? But um, I, you know, it's, 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 it's a little bit of an adjustment We're we're, 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 we're getting through it as best we can. And we're, 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 we're figuring things out. It's, it's still the three down thing is just still a little bit jointed for me too. So. Uh, I, I did say this and, and not to equate it at all to the XFL, but I do, I do like the, the smaller number of teams. I like it being a manageable game load where you could conceivably watch all four games or three or four games. If you wanted to, I thought the ESPN app was great with the on demand and being able to do that. It felt very much like my time last February in the XFL where like I could watch, you know, two games or the one game and watch it the next day and not, you know, where sometimes the NFL is like so overwhelming. And yeah. you're like, well, I, I want to watch all these games, but they're all on at the same time or I can't watch this or I can't watch that. So I, I really like that, like manageable fill you up for the weekend and then you can go on with the week. I think that that is um, really good. Just really compelling stuff. So very cool. Well, let's move into um, oh, let's preview the matchups this week. Who we got? Yeah, so I, I have a little tidbit story with each of these matchups. I mean, this isn't like your big, this is your Marcus and uh, analysis, but these things that that was funny for each one. Uh, so we obviously we have the Liars, uh, Lions stamps tonight. You know, we're previewing that. Uh, Nathan Rourke is listed as a starter for week two. We get into this a lot with Dave Naylor, you know, Michael Riley is their big, you know, MOP quarterback, all the all these things, you know, the veteran gunslinger. Uh, but Nathan Rourke is the first, like the first CFL rookie quarterback ever to debut in week one. And there are very few rookie quarterbacks ever, you know, debut anyway, non CFL or otherwise. I mean, Jim Mullen put up a, a graphic that was it's like, these are the main, like the leading lions quarterbacks that are Canadian in the last 50 years. And there's not many. So it, it is, it is a lot of pressure on Nathan Rourke for his second start. So. Very cool. Toronto uh, traveling. Uh, I believe they're traveling to Winnipeg. They're on the road going to Winnipeg. Uh, only, uh, Winnipeg's only an eight-point favorite there. Yeah, so I, I want to pull this up. I'm, I'm pulling up my 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 uh, Wikipedia right here. So you know, Macaw Bethel Thompson here, Paul. This is, and, and we've talked about him before. I've told you he's like the John Moxley kind of. He's got that that weird, you know, kind of rugged, um, rugged, handsome, kind of crazy, kind of scary, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, I don't really know what this guy's thinking. Um, this guy. I, I pulled up his Wikipedia last night. I spent about 20 minutes reading through it. He, uh, I want you, this is everything that we really focus on when we talk about these leagues and these alternative players. Like he's been signed and cut from the 49ers three times in his career. Three times. Yeah. Like on the practice. Way. So he is the grandson of the 1948 Olympic shot put champion, Wilbur Moose Thompson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's he a random a fact. Yeah, he's I'm, I, I pulled it He's a journeyman quarterback. He's been a member of five different NFL teams, two CFL teams, and one team in both the uh, Arena Football League, United Football League, and then don't forget, he was the star quarterback of the Aviators in the Spring League. Yep, that's true. And um, you know, he was he was at UCLA, uh, decided to decided to leave UCLA and we'll go to Sacramento State. And, you know, Sacramento State's a decent one double A football team here down here in, in the States. We have two different levels of uh, top level football division, division one. There's one A and then there's one double A and Sacto Sac State's a decent one double A team. And the reason only reason I know that is because my alma mater also is in one double A and they play them every year. So I do. I am familiar with S Sacramento State and it looks like he did great numbers there, too, in college. So it's it's not a surprise that, you know, he's 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 on now. You know, he's man, it's, it's just a lot. A lot of different teams he's been on. He's been on the Vikings twice, the Dolphins twice. He's been on the Blue Bombers. The Patriots, the, uh, the, the 49ers, the Eagles, the Blue Bombers, the Argonauts. I mean, it just this is someone, you know, he, he's a little older. I think he's 33. I mean, this is just, uh, again, you know, and, and we followed him for a while, and this is probably no new thing, but I really wanted to, to stand McLeod. And uh, and and anoint him as as the king of the CFL and kind of everything that we stand for here on the on the podcast. Is he so the Canadian? I, I, is he the Canadian version of uh, uh, what's his name? Fitz Magic. Is he the Canadian Fitz, Fitz Magic? Is that what we're gonna go with? You know, I, I like that. I, you know, I am famously a Washington football team. I'm very excited. Dorothy and I had a long conversation about that yesterday. We went on a, a hike to a waterfall, and I said I'm very. Um, 
pleased with my decisions. This was obviously we were going on the BC Lions. I said, I'm very pleased about my BC Lions decision. And I am very pleased about my Washington football. I like that. I think McLeod has a little fits in him. I, I like that. He doesn't a- have eight kids, but I think he's, <laughs> I think he's got. <laughs> All right. Montreal finally opens up their season after the opening bye week. Uh, they're on the road uh, taking on your former Elks. Yeah, this is this is just uh, this is a, a, an interesting one. James Wilder, he was complaining last week about something. I can't remember what he was tweeting about. He uh, he enjoys playing with his six pack showing like a superhero, but Buzz Kill, Jamie Elizondo, you know the culture changing Elks head coach says he doesn't want him to do that. Man. Are you Lighten a fan up. of are you a fan of the crop? I'm not a fan of the crop top with that football. I think you need to wear a jersey all the way down. Yeah. Come on. The crop top thing, the, the what is it? Who is it? The Zeke Ezekiel Elliott that wears it all the time for the Cowboys. I don't know. It's it's just a weird, weird look. I, I Zeke yeah, Zeke needs to focus on holding the football and not, you true. know, showing his dabs off. That's very true. And and getting another contract. Um, I think he's in. Is is he almost? Maybe he signed a new one. I'm I'm not, I'm he's, I'm spacing. Yeah, the Cowboys are fascinating to watch. The Cowboys yes. are fascinating to watch. The, the three point scoring uh, preseason Hall of Fame uh, Cowboys. That'll be good. But anyway, he, he James says I. This always been my swag. I get it from my dad. It's a retro look back in the day. That's how jerseys were made. So I'm trying to replicate that. I just I would hate to tackle someone and like you're like we're grabbing the ant. Like, are you getting scratched? Are you getting like? I don't. I don't know. I just would think that that would be a very like not comfortable thing to wear uh, on the football on the gridiron. Yeah, Ezekiel signed a uh, six-year contract um, for a lot of money. For a lot of money back in uh, let's see, is it two thousand twenty-one? So last year, he's yeah, definitely got extension. No, two years ago. I'm sorry. Yeah. So he's definitely you know he's definitely under contract for a little while. So maybe he can buy some more you know fabric to go with those crop tops. I don't know. Anyway, but Jamie said, Coach Elizondo says, having the jersey tucked in, that's just a rule of, or having the jersey tucked up, that's just a rules violation. You can't play the game that way. That one is simple. We do everything the way that it should be done during the game, and that was addressed, and we need to move on. I mean, th- but this is buzzkill. I mean, this is why I'm off the Elks. I don't want to deal with this. Like, I, you know, also, like, I mean, who do you talk to in your life that's a BC Lions fan? Right. I mean, everyone, you got Dave Campbell, we, he's carrying the flag for the Elks. We got Connor O'Neill. We got all these friends of the show. I mean, who really is a BC Lions fan? So I, I'm really happy. And the more I hear from Coach Elizondo, I'm really couldn't be happier to be done with the Elks. There you go. Uh, the final game uh, on Saturday is going to be uh, Hamilton visiting uh, Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan's a 1.5, 1. 1.5 1. point favorite. Um, but Hamilton is, you know, is a good team. And it's it's it'll be interesting to see if they drop to zero and two to start the season. That's going to be very interesting in Hamilton to see if you know if they can't rally back from you know zero and two. And Saskatchewan, you know, they're a good team. What do you think, Reed? Uh, Dave's predicting an upset. He thinks that that would be one of the most compelling storylines coming out of the weekend is if Hamilton goes 0 and 2, you know, the big, the big point favorites to start the season. So yeah, Jeremiah Mazzoli, he's starting again. Uh, you know, he played good last week. It seemed like, you know, we talked about that in the home opener with the blue bombers that, you know, both offenses really kind of came out of the gate hot and then kind of suffered in the second you know half. So we'll have to see because, because the rough riders did the same thing. You know, they came out and Cody Fajardo, you know, they had 30, what 35 or whatever points in, in the first half and only score two the whole second half against the Lions to kind of hold off that. And that was what was so compelling about that game was it was like the Rough Riders couldn't score and you know the Lions kept like, go, get a TD, get a TD, get a point, get a point. And it was like, are they going to hold them off? Because they just couldn't, you know, Cody and Fajardo and the team just couldn't get anything together that second half. So Very cool stuff to see this week. Let's um, Hopefully the predictions that Reed threw down there or that Reed has given us from other people come true. We'll see. We'll see what happens. And uh, your favorite, uh, uh, Red, the Red Blacks have, have a bye week this week. So, yeah, I'm still getting used to that. I'm still getting used to, like, every team, every week. Like, one team's not playing. But I guess that makes sense. You know, we got four great matchups, and then the Red Blacks will have the week off. But, you know, that was stunning, too, the, the stop with the Elks. You know, the Elks got stopped at the one-yard line coming back to score. So it was really compelling uh, defensive stop by the Red Blacks uh, defense. Interesting. Put a team in Quebec, and you don't have this one, one, one team a week having a bye week thing happening. Just put a team in Quebec. Done and done. Uh, for your uh, new team, the Lions, uh, Nathan Rourke listed as a starter for that game against the Stamps. Yeah, 
Yeah, so we're, we're excited about that. Uh, so we're down here. Uh, I, I just thought it was interesting, the three down power rankings, uh, you know, shuffling around a lot. You know, the Lions are all the way down in eighth place, not feeling great about that. Winnipeg, they're still really high in Winnipeg, and, and Hamilton's still at number two, even coming off the loss. So uh, I, I saw some um, certain online commentators upset that the Red Blocks were still in last place coming off of a of a win with, you know, obviously the Elks are still in seventh, uh, even though they dropped that big game to the Red Blocks. So I just thought that was interesting that, the the power rankings kind of shuffling around wanted to give a shout out to the to three down there oh i see you're way ahead of me in terms yeah, of like where, the, the that's where we're the doc and i'm like and you're just talking about these things and i'm like i'm, I'm stuck on one page and i'm like when are we going to talk about these things but like reed's already talking about him he's like it's kind of like inception he's getting them in without me even knowing it's great uh the ratings let's move on to the ratings then now that i'm caught up turn the page um writer nation apparently Big numbers, right? Big numbers. Yeah, you, you're talking about this. Uh, TSN Public Relations uh, they attracted 774 thousand viewers, which I think is tremendous, right? And so I will say this, and this is where we were dummy dumbs before. You know, we're coming into the CFL and we're talking to XFL and we're talking ratings and we're saying all this stuff. I mean, I think 775 thousand people watching the CFL game is that is a tremendous viewership mm -hmm. of any kind because you figure, you know, one tenth the size. Right, see, um, Canada. I mean, that would be you know seven million people in the states. I mean, yeah. that's what watched the Cowboys uh, Steelers game, which was uh, we'll get to here in the ratings. But that was the highest uh, opposite the Winnipeg uh, home opener. That was the highest uh, preseason game that the NFL has had like you know since I think 2017. So I mean, tremendous viewership for for the Rough Riders. I think that that uh, bodes very well, obviously, to their their support in, in the local market. Uh, Winnipeg Hamilton got 683,000, which is a great number to start things off, and then the other other two weren't yeah. so impressive you know around three hundred thousand a piece for the uh stamps and argos and then the red blacks and elks so the average yeah. the average is about five hundred twenty six thousand per week that's what we're seeing right now on all yeah, the these games. are from yeah these are from adam seaborn i've seen mike mitchell had slightly different numbers i've seen a couple they're all kind of within that 500 viewer or whatever i just if you're coming out they actually they had 683 100 and this is kind of what i looked at a couple <laughs> different sources this was what i saw but uh yeah the, the 318 for the toronto calgary game is because you know i thought Bo is like the big star i thought Bo levi i thought the stamps they have the new jerseys and so i don't know i just thought that they were the big them and like the rough riders i thought they were like the big darling markets I, that, mm -hmm. and it, that was the earlier game you know the uh, the ottawa edmonton game was later so to me that would make sense for that to be lower ratings but obviously edmonton has a higher um you know fan base you know the kind of that community support there so and the attendance numbers uh surprisingly um uh you know the, you had uh, the rough riders and lions at thirty three thousand. that's pretty solid the red blacks and Elks at thirty thousand. hamilton you know hamilton and winnipeg you know twenty nine thousand. then you get the argo stamps 23,000 uh, a significant drop off from the other the other three games yeah and that's at calgary you know yeah. that was at calgary that's not in toronto you know the argos don't have a home opener i, yeah, I believe it's one more week uh you know, not not wonderful there. I will say, oh, the other thing that uh, it wasn't quite a sellout in the home opener because uh, the Hamilton or the Blue Bombers, I think they hold like 30,000, whatever. It was just, you know, a hair under that. Really surprising that they couldn't get uh, that full sellout for the home opener after two years off, you know, returning Great Cup champions. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. But, um, I, you know, when I saw these numbers, I was like, oh, well, Toronto's not turning out. But it's like that happened in Calgary. So we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, definitely you have to see what happens because that's been a big concern is how supportive people in Toronto are of their team. And hopefully, you know, they, they'll they be glad to see football and they'll, you know, fill BMO field up. So they're playing at BMO now, right? They did move over to BMO? Yeah. Cool. Uh, moving on to little tidbits of the news. Uh, CFL has fined Lions linebacker Jordan Williams for his headshot to uh, the writers quarterback Cody Fardo. Um Wow. Uh, yeah, this was, you know, they, they were deep in the end zone coming out. You know, Cody was trying to do a dive. Uh, pretty blatant. You know, they call that like an unprotected. It, it's it's tough there, right? Where you're the quarterback and you're out of the pocket. and You're trying to kind of dive over everything. I will say the deeper end zones, totally love. Love everything about that with the CFL. I, you know, the, the, the uprights at the front, that's kind of weird, whatever. But having that deeper end zone allows for so much more like flexibility yeah. in terms of like getting the ball in there. I think that that is phenomenal. I love everything about the deep end zones. I haven't seen one negative thing about that. So, 
it's interesting enough to that they didn't they didn't call it during the game, but then of course after later on they went back and you know assessed the fine and uh, during the media during the media calls and everything that Fajardo joked that he wasn't big enough name to yet to get that call on the field, but you know the CFL clearly is is you know taking these things to heart and I have to say this CFL players you're not getting paid that much watch out on your fines just take it easy just take it easy because there's other fines that have come out too. Yeah, the two others. I think I think you're a little more on the age. I think it's Fajar though. I think it's your. I think you're a little more on the Fajar. I think it's. A, I think it's a. a, a it's a. Jay it's a Latino so. thing for me. So that you That's know, okay. down I here just, it's called Fajardo. So we'll we'll, okay. we'll 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 get clarification on that. So um, the other fines that went out, Noah Hallett from the Blue Bombers uh, got hit with a fine for an unnecessarily hit on defensive back Frankie Williams from Hamilton, and then uh, Edmonton Elks offensive lineman David Beard. Uh, through a chop block at Red Blacks defensive lineman Cleon Lang. <clears throat> As per league policy, the amount of player fines were not disclosed. Stop Which getting fines. Stop getting fines because you don't have that much. You're not getting paid that much to begin with. I think it's weird that they don't disclose the fine numbers. Interesting. Yeah, it is. It is weird. I normally you, you get them in here in America. Just saying. Craig Dickinson from the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, the head coach there, said um, that Brendan Labatt, who is their all-star offensive lineman, might be interested in returning the team if restrictions are lowered for CFL players on August 15th. Yeah, you know, we, we lost a lot of these players early on. I mean, that's tough. That's tough to get up to shape and go, I man, unless they're mm -hmm. doing workouts in the in the offseason, right? But that that's a lot of work to come in, you know, as hard as training camp was for a lot of these players to come in two, three weeks into the season, right, and get up to shape. Uh, but I mean, obviously, he's a he's a rock star, you know, athlete. But I do think that that is will be an interesting storyline to watch if players are able to, you know, come off the couch or the bench or whatever, you know, in the middle of the of the August here and get back up to game shape. So. And Dickinson, you know, said said the you know when you miss training camp, it's tough. I'm paraphrasing what he said right now, but he thinks a guy like Labatt could probably do it because he's a veteran, he's smart, and he knows what to do with his body. If he's interested in coming back, they're interested in having him clearly to bolster that offensive line. If he's that great, uh, we'll see what happens. Very cool. Here's one. The, yeah, like the more, next one. more problems in Edmonton. More problems in Edmonton. <laughs> Sir Vincent Rogers, great name by the way. Great name, Sir Vincent Rogers, uh, confirmed he's tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, he tested positive days ago for COVID and the reservation he initially had about the vaccine just changed. That's good, Sir Vincent. Personally, I have only minor symptoms like congestion and smell, taste being off. And uh, he decided, he also decided, is this right? Like, this is, yeah, these are quotes. So he decided to get the, the vaccine, but still, you know, is having the minor symptoms. And now you wonder, like, if he didn't get the vaccine, if he didn't get the two doses exactly. of the Pfizer, would he have had more serious symptoms? And that's what we keep getting at is like, you can still catch COVID and you can still have COVID and not really be affected by it if you have the vaccines. It's only like 0.1%, 0.01% of the people that are dying right now are vaccinated. Everybody else that's dying is unvaccinated. There's a, such a small number of people that are dying that are vaccinated that you really you really need to think about, you know, well, I mean, yeah, it's 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 a vaccine that that we don't normally have, you know, in terms like the other vaccines have dead, like dead or weakened virus strains. Right. But this is a different kind of vaccine completely where it like tells your cells how it, like it's like a computer program you install and it tells your cells how to fight a certain protein from a certain virus. And, that, and, and basically, that's that's the gist of it. So when you get the vaccine and you have minor symptoms, that, that's going to be expected if you get if you get sick with covid. It's endemic. It's going to happen every single year now. And getting vaccinated is the best way to stop the variant. That's the big problem now. Yeah, it was interesting because the Elks had the, the big breakout on Friday. You know, we got done with the home opener. Dave Campbell tweeted, you know, they had. And so uh, Sir Vincent was one of them. And I don't know if they've disclosed the other player yet, if it was a false positive. But they kind of had that. Remember, I tweet, or I texted you on Friday and we're like, oh, no. But so, I mean, I think they've got it under wraps. They've got everything figured out. But again, um, just something to keep an eye on. You know, Delta and everything's coming on. Even in Hawaii here, they've, they've pulled back restrictions since we've been here. So, um, you know, this is still very much a thing. It's going to be a thing every single year. There's going to be another variant that comes around next year. And the best way to go about it is like, like we, we know we can't go back to the shutdowns anymore, but so get vaccinated, like get vaccinated. This is something that, you know, any concerns you have, I'm sure will be alleviated in due time. Like if you think it's a population control, you're into those conspiracies. Trust me, 
I've, I've done enough research on the vaccine to know that like I'm listening to the science and I know that it's okay. Get your vaccinations. Anybody that I know, anyone that I know personally or professionally, go get your vaccine. Even if you have pre-existing condition, go get your vaccine. Paul, don't get this canceled before this. You know who I'm talking to, sir. Go get your vaccine. All right. We're going to take a break. Come back. We're going to take a break. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk to Dave. Let's talk. Let's get, let's get Dave in here. And then uh, there's actually XFL news. Some, uh, not exciting XFL news, but there's exciting uh, things to talk about. Sam Peters potentially have a new owner per Rod Peterson. And, and it should be. We got more stuff coming up after Dave. So. Well, Dave Naylor, I, I really appreciate this. It's been a long time coming. It, it, no better way than to get up at five in the morning here in Hawaii and talk to you as the sun rises. So thank you so much for coming on. How are you doing today? Very well. Very well. Excited for week two of the CFL. It's it's finding the rhythm of, of covering the league week to week is uh, it's been a bit of a process. because I think we're like the players, we're the officials. So we we got into a totally different work rhythm, you know, and, and it's great to be back to, you know, do what I like to do and usually do for, you know, 23 weeks of the regular season this year, it's going to be 14, you know, but, uh, or 21 weeks or so. Um, so it's, it's great to be doing it again. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, from an outside perspective, just watching the league and covering it so far, um, really fun weekend. I thought, you know, everything that wasn't, a ton of glaring issues, right? I mean, it seemed like, you know, the football was good. People were excited. What were kind of your week one reflections after the weekend? You know, I, th I thought that the football was entertaining and I don't think it was aesthetically great, you know, in terms of just execution. And, and there were periods of, of almost every game where teams went cold and, and on offense. And I did a little comparison actually just, and look, small sample size, but I was just curious you know, what was the, what was the total point scored in week one in 2019? What was to the total, total point scored in week one of 2018? And the other metric I thought that would be kind of valuable was passing yards, because I think we all understand that defenses are likely to be able to gel more quickly than offenses when you've been off so long. And um, yeah, there were, uh, again, I'm going to go these numbers off the top of my head. I think there were 158 points scored uh, this week. In one of the years, there was, you know, around 200. One of the years, about 180. So it was definitely down. And passing yards was about 1,600 passing yards in week one. Both of the last two years in week one had been over 2,000. So that's, a, you know, that's a significant difference. And when you look at a, a percentage, you're talking about 20% fewer passing yards. And again, small sample size. But, uh, you know, overall, I, I thought the games were entertaining. And I think the fact that three of the underdogs won straight up kind of uh, not just in betting parlance, but but you know, when you look at it for the course of the season, and I think we've all you know focused on there might be some real surprises. And there's some I think that provides some intrigue when you see you know teams like Ottawa go to Edmonton and win. Um, now, they're not going to win with that formula very often, <laughs> but hey. You know, wins is win, especially in the opening week on the road. And Toronto, I guess, was the one that stood out for me the most because they have been, you know, a really poor team in the last two years. I mean, back to back four win seasons, and in both cases, they they made a habit of getting blown out early. Like they were not close at halftime, and they also got blown out in the early in both seasons. I mean, they started twenty eighteen, I believe, one and five, and they were zero and six in twenty nineteen. So you know, the last two years. They're one in 11 for six weeks of the season. And as I say, most of those games that weren't close by halftime. So to see them hang with Calgary at 14 to 11 and then come from behind the win. I mean, McLeod Bethel Thompson, he's in his third year in the CFL. And I always say this third year for a quarterback in the CFL is either when it clicks or it doesn't. You know, he's really tough to evaluate and judge a guy's potential before that third year. And usually if they haven't figured it out by that time, it, you know, it, it rarely happens. So he's, he's kind of in that zone. And uh, so, yeah, overall, I, I thought I thought they were they were entertaining games. That's really what I was looking for. You know, it wasn't horribly sloppy football. Um, you know, it wasn't offenses that, that couldn't make it down the field except for Ottawa's. Uh, and, and I think there were kind of multiple reasons for that. And, and we anticipated that offensively they were going to be challenged. So I thought overall the, the league had a pretty good week. 
Yeah, it was exciting, you know, especially, you know, we covered McCall Bethel Thompson in the spring league, you know, I know he had been in the CFL before, sure. but as someone that, I mean, and that epitomizes kind of what we try to cover on the podcast, right? These journeyman players that have been on so many different teams, right? And have been signed and let go and signed and, let, you know, signed back to the same teams again and let go. And then to see him have that success uh, is really exciting, you know, as, as someone that wants these players to get more opportunities, you know. Well, McLeod Bethel Thompson is your poster guy for that, right? I mean, he's 33 years old. I, I forget. I counted one time how many times he's been signed in the National Football League. It's, it's up there, like even by the standards of guys who have a lot of stops on their passport. I think he's been a San Francisco 49er three different times, at least. You know, and, uh, and, and when you talk to him, and I think this is one of the things that endured him to both his coaches and his team in the last three years, is, is he is a guy who just, He's, a, he's relentless in terms of work and study, and he's, he's a football life. You know, he's not a guy who is into this kind of uh, half-assed, right? It, it, he's, that, is, that is who he is. And, and, and I think, you know, be, I think one of the reasons people maybe judged him a little more quickly than they would have otherwise is the fact that he didn't come here as a 24-year-old. Right? He came here as a 31-year-old, and, and that people maybe had different expectations. But, I, you know, I, I always say no matter what age – it takes a while in the CFL. Like I, there was a game in 2019. They started him against Winnipeg. It was the game the Argos. The Argos were 0 and 6. Winnipeg was 6 and 0, and they were down 20 to nothing at the half. Toronto came back and won that game. I'm not sure that if Toronto doesn't come back and win that game, whether McLeod Bethel Thompson is still in the lake. Like I think I think his. His situation with the Argonauts was that tenuous at that stage of things that, you know, they came back. It was a miraculous victory. Uh, one of the very few highlights and maybe the highlight of the, of the season for the Argos in 2019. But I also think it might have saved his CFL career. Well, and, you know, and even now, if it weren't for injuries and things, you know, he probably wouldn't be put in the opportunity he is anyway right now. Yeah, I mean, Nick Arbuckle was, I think, signed to be their guy. Right? Like he's, he's a younger guy considered to have a lot of upside seven starts in the CFL, but he completed, but 30, 73% of his passes for Calgary, you know, good touchdown to interception ratio, uh, you know, had, and has a history with the starting with the head coach, right. Who was his quarterback coach in Calgary and Ryan Dinwiddie. So I think when we looked at that situation, I think again, and if you, if you're thinking of longer term, the Argos would have more of an ability to turn Nick Arbuckle into their long-term franchise quarterback than a guy who's already 33. You know, although, you know, 33, but how many hits has he taken in the last 10 years? You know, not, not that many in practice, right? So, you know, he may have a little more, uh, you know, a little more room on, on the road ahead than a lot of 33 year old quarterbacks. But yeah, I, 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 you know, I think that was one of those situations that was, was going to play out as a competition. But if it, unless it, but if it was a dead heat, I think Nick Arbuckle was going to get the nod. And as it turns out, I mean, Arbuckle's injury took him out of the mix. There was just no way, the way they were splitting the reps in training camp that he could even far buckle have been healthy by week number one. I just think given the, from what I understand about the way the reps were being divided because of the injuries that it would have been McLeod Bethel Thompson. And, you know, like he said yesterday, someone asked him a question about, you know, what do you do to hold on to the number one job or something? He said, like every play is an evaluation. Like it's like in football, your performance review happens every time you snap the ball. It's essentially what he said. And, and, uh, you know, I think he's made no secret of the fact he'd like to be the starting quarterback in this team. And, you know, people forget this guy led the CFL in touchdowns in 2019 you know, and put up a lot of yards. Now, there was a lot of garbage time there, right? Um, games where they got blown out of and defenses relaxed and he was able to throw for a lot of yards and throw some touchdowns. They also had, I think, three of their four wins in 2019 for Toronto came against Ottawa, you know, which, which Ottawa had a bizarre season. They were 2-0 and and then they went 1-15. and So, you know, when you... When you factor in that his stats, the, the percentage of them that came against Ottawa, the percentage of them that came in game that they were blown out. I mean, I, that's why I think people don't regard him the way you normally would regard a guy who led the league in touchdown passes. Yeah, it's just exciting. You know, one thing changes or, you know, something happens a different way. And these people, you know, uh, players don't get these opportunities. You know, it's just exciting. Another um, quarterback situation I wanted to talk to you about and, and then specifically more about C218 and all that stuff. Um, sure. The BC game was probably the most in compelling thing that I've seen football wise in many, many years. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but uh, glued to my seat, I went back, I watched the whole replay because I had missed it the night before. Uh, first off, thoughts on that game, and then I want to get into the sports betting ramifications. 
Well, you're talking about the quarterback situation, the drama that was all there. I mean, it's funny because there's some context around this, right? Like the CFL has historically been a league where teams have not only um, hid information, they've used misinformation, which I, I think that's a difference, right? There's a difference between not telling me everything about the status of your players and the, or actually telling me stuff that's not true. Okay. And, and, and teams have done that. They have put misinformation into the, into the hands of the media to try to create decoys out of players who are starting or not starting. And the league, you know, has made been very strong in its messaging that it wants that to stop. And as proof, they have brought in NFL style injury reports for the first time. We've never had these before, you know, who practiced, who didn't, who was limited game status, probable, or sorry, not probable, uh, questionable, doubtful out. That is all completely new. And it's a real cultural shift. So when Mike Riley, you know, who was, Certainly the team had indicated Mike R Michael Riley was going to be the starter. The PA announcer announced him in stadium as the starter. And our broadcast, you know, talked about, we were on the air for what, 34 minutes before kickoff or something. And, and the conversation had been all around Michael Riley's starting quarterback. So when he didn't start to a lot of people, it came out as, well, here's the same old CFL. Nothing's changed. Now, I, I think, Two things happened that have kind of muted the, the, the initial reaction to that because my phone's blowing up, Twitter's blowing up. What the, you know, and of course, all these people that bet Lions plus six and find out the guy who's a former MOP is not playing. And instead, a, a guy who is a, you know, right out of college rookie is starting, which almost never happens in the CFL. It happened, you know, two or three years ago with Chris Strebler. Before that, it hadn't happened since 1994. So this is not a league that rookies start in. You know, Nathan Rourke, we have the third one since 1994 to start an opening week game. Two things happened to mitigate the reaction. One is the Lions came back in the second half and covered the spread. So all those people that were on Twitter screaming in the first quarter, they got real quiet after the game when they cashed the tickets. Just funny how that works. Not such an issue when they cash the ticket. And I think the league dodged a bit of a PR bullet by virtue of that. The other one is, I think, you, you apply some logic. The Lions' explanation was that Riley's shoulder did not respond to treatment, or elbow, excuse me, did not respond to treatment the way they expect. And they did, and that, you know, you, I don't know what time, I don't know if he got a shot, I don't know what it was, therapy, but whatever he got, they expected it to respond by game time. You know, they're coming out of the tunnel, the anthem starting, and Riley says, I can't go. And we had observed that he was not throwing deep balls at all during warm up, you know, so it, it, you tell he was, he was limited with his range to some degree, at least in practice. So Nathan Rourke starts and, and we were all scratching our heads. And then during the halftime, of course, Rick Campbell gives an injury an update says, Hey, we can't start Mike Riley. You know, it's not the best for the team. It's not best for him. And then he comes out after halftime and he's, he's back under center, which turned a bizarre night into an even more bizarre night. I guess whatever they gave him over uh, before the game, kicked in at halftime. He said, yep, I can go. And they go that direction. The other reason I'll tell you the, the primary reason I don't think the lions were up to any funny business. And I like, I, and I think that is, I think that was always a bad look for the CFL, you know, because, you know, I covered a game a couple of years ago where a team lied about its starting quarterback for a playoff game and used misinformation, not holding information back, actually said stuff in, into the hands of the media that was not true. And, and I, and I think that's a bad look. I don't think that's a, a way for, professional football league to operate. I don't think it's fair to your media partners. I don't, I don't think it's fair to your fans. So in this case, though, the CFL brought in a rule this year that says you can only dress two quarterbacks for a game, not three. Okay? One of the things that does is that you're only going to dress guys that you think can play. Nobody is going to say, hey, wait a minute, Michael Riley can't play, but we think it's more valuable to have him as a decoy and have the opposition think that he's going to play than it is to have a backup quarterback. <laughs> and I don't think anybody in the risk reward back, uh, equation would say, yeah, a decoy as a starting quarterback is more valuable than having two healthy quarterbacks. Yeah, it, it just doesn't make any sense that any team would do that. So if you didn't believe Michael Riley could play, you wouldn't dress him. So I, I actually believe as, as unlikely as the scenarios that, as the Lions presented, and I think it is unlikely. I mean, people telling me I've never heard of that, that you walk out of the tunnel with your starting quarterback, and by the time you get to the field, he's not your starting quarterback. I, I do think it's plausible, and I, and I just think when you factor in you know, the risk that they would have been taking to dress a guy at quarterback who can't play, uh, especially when your other option is a rookie, you don't know how he's going to stand up to hits in pro football. He's never done it, all those kind of things, although he took a lot, took a lot of hits in college and stood up very well. Um, 
it just doesn't make any sense. So it was, it was high drama. And as I say, I, I think the reaction on Twitter post game would have been a lot, a lot different. And Saskatchewan's big lead held up. Yeah, I mean, just the the heart behind that, and just you know him chucking the ball out, and and just you know the players having to drop back or you know drop forward to catch. I mean, it was just uh, it felt very much like uh, Fitzpatrick coming in last year for the Dolphins, right? And, and really, just it's like the the old gunslinger coming in and saving the day. I mean, it really was just remarkable to to see. It was very exciting. The, the scary thing for me, if I'm the Lions, and this is the same case in Ottawa where Matt Nichols seemed to be struggling to, you know, throw the ball any any distance as well, is this is week one. <laughs> like, how, how do you recover from that injury? Uh, and, and how did it happen, I guess? You know, like, we always joke about in football, the guy saying week one, it's the only week where everybody's healthy. Well, here was week one, and, and it wasn't the case, you know, with the most important players on the field. And I know coaches across this league were very careful in training camp. Know, in terms of how much they ask guys to throw, how much they ask players in general to do is it being 20 months off. And they were dealing with various levels of fitness and, and those kinds of things. But uh, I, think that's, I think that's a real kind of dangerous sign for those teams in, in BC and Ottawa. Their quarterbacks in week number one seem to be having issues throwing the football because this is going to be a tight schedule. There are no bye weeks this year, you know, um, and – and, and just the nature of it is there's there's not that much time to, to rest in, you know, along, the, along the schedule here. So we'll see. Uh, Riley's not starting week number two. You know, it's going to be Nathan Rourke again. We assume Riley's going to dress, but we'll wait and see whether that's the case as well to, if it's tonight's game. Yeah, how do you feel about Nathan Rourke going into the game? I'm now uh... – I, I think I've jumped on the, the BC Lions fan, uh, bandwagon this week in terms of, of my fandom. You know, the Elks have uh, said some questionable things about, you know, uh, the XFL. And there's been, you know, there's been some other issues there. So, uh, but, but uh, what, do, what, what do we think about Nathan Rourke? Because I will use the we now as a BC Lions fan. What do we think about Nathan Rourke going into the game? You know, I, I, I talked to Nathan uh, two days ago in a great conversation with him. And, you know, it's funny. He, he's the, one of the things that's how he's so almost overwhelmed by the reaction, you know, being a Canadian quarterback starting. I mean, he grew up in Oakville, you know, um, actually about 10 minutes from where I am right now, you know, sort of halfway between Toronto and, and Hamilton. Um, you know, he's like a lot of Canadian kids. You know, he grew up idolizing an NFL quarterback. You know, Brett Favre was his guy. He wanted he wanted to play in the NFL. He wanted to chase that dream. He went to high school in Alabama. He went. He couldn't get a Division One scholarship. He played at a junior college. And then he goes to the University of Ohio, and arguably is the most successful quarterback in you know 130 years of University of Ohio court, uh, football. He he uh, he won three bowl games. I, I remember. I think I think Ohio had won. I, mean, I remember I've said this put this up several times. I think Ohio had won like two bowl games in their history. He won three, you know, before he got there, and and he was he was a tough guy. Like he he ran the ball four hundred and twenty five times in three years for more than twenty six hundred yards. And you take a lot of hits. He's a, he's a very physical. The, the, the adjective that was used to, to describe Nathan Rourke to me when he was in college so often was gamer. Like you just watch him and you're like, this guy is a gamer. He'll do whatever it takes. He'll take hits. He'll, you know, he'll, he, he'll take yards after contact, very physical player. And I'd watched him on television a little bit. I got to see him play live in his last season against the university of Buffalo. It wasn't when he had a particularly good day. So it was one of those days he had to rely on his, on his running and taking off a little bit, especially um, struggled in the first half. And it was funny. I talked to him a bit about that uh, this week. And I said, you know, you ran the football a lot in college. Like, is that, part of your game now he says yeah they don't really want me to do that you know, like, it's all about you know my reads my progressions the ball coming out on time getting my footwork straight you know when when uh, when i'm hot recognizing that it's hot in the pocket and getting out of there they haven't talked to me a lot about running the football he said, i'd like to do more of that and he feels that and i think we see this in all football that guys who run the ball a lot in college you know can do that early in their careers and, and the longer you go you find you refine your game. You have to rely on that less, and your team doesn't want to. You know, is more nervous the older you get about you taking hits. But that is a big part of Nathan Rourke's game that he's having to go into the professional ranks, kind of leaving behind. He had one carry for ten yards in that in that first game, so that's a big adjustment for him. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I thought he showed pretty well. I mean, they, there was a bit of deer in headlights. I think in the first half, just as there is again. Third quarter, third rookie quarterback to start a week one since 1994. You know, 1994 um, was Anthony Calvillo did it. Chris Trevler did it about three years ago, and now Nathan Rourke. Um, and 
and and the the flat out first rookie Canadian quarterback ever to do it in the history of the league. Never been a Canadian quarterback as a rookie start week number one. So I think when you put the context around that, you put that Mosaic Stadium in Saskatchewan is considered one of the toughest places to play in the league. Never mind on opening night after a pandemic when they're sold out. Uh, and, and they're a very good and athletic defense. Uh, I think you, you just sort of look for him to become a little more refined, you know, make a, make those you know, make those reads a little more efficiently, you know, make more good throws. He was 10 of 18 for 194 yards. A ton of those yards, of course, came on, you know, the one throw that he made right before halftime that, that went for a big game. But, you know, he's all about getting better. You know, that's that's all. And, and he's he's a guy who, I think has very high expectations for himself. I don't think he's put out of his mind playing in the National Football League someday. And he, you know, he's young enough uh, to be able to do it. I mean, he's you look at the Mid American Conference. You know, he's considered by a lot of people the best Mid American Conference quarterback to post since Ben Roethlisberger. But again, you know, a lot of his game rushing the football the way he did that's not going to translate to the NFL, right? So that's so one of the things. Even to be successful in the CFL, he's got to be more of a pass first quarterback. If he is to keep his hope and dream alive of getting the National Football League one day, I think he's going to do that as well. Because the same way, you know, his the, the, his style Mac doesn't necessarily translate to the CFL. I don't think it translates to the NFL as well. Because he's not a he's not a burner. Right? He's not a guy who's going to get on the edge and just leave people behind like Lamar Jackson or something like that. He, he's more a guy who would you know take the tough yards, bounce off the hit, head for the sidelines, that kind. of uh, yeah, I just think it's going to be compelling to watch and, and something, you know, again, all these um, fun storylines to talk about now versus like, are we going to play? Like, you know, this is something very exciting. <laughs> that to watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to talk to you before we get off the, the Lions uh, thing, you know, the C218, all this stuff, you know, even <clears throat> on the broadcast this week, we're talking uh, sports betting C18 is uh, 218 is passed. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what that looks like. I mean, they're even saying that on the broadcast, right? But yet, uh, this is this lifeblood that's going to save. I mean, we've been very um, hesitant about it on, on the podcast. What are your thoughts on this and how important? I mean, I know that you're in a unique position where you're part of you know this broadcasting and stuff, but but it does seem like it's something. Uh, even the announcement this week talking about you know uh, getting some prizes and the the race to the Grey Cup and getting these things doesn't necessarily equate to this two million dollars that we were going to see uh, per CFL team. Yeah, you know it's funny. I I think there's a few ways to approach this. Um, anecdotally. I think it's going to help the league. You just, I think people are focused. Uh, you know, we're talking about betting. We're, I mean, you've always been able to bet on the CFL. And in Canada, we've had kind of a gray market when it came to sports betting. You know, like the U.S., it's been either legal or not. And in Canada, we've had this kind of gray market where they don't stop offshores from operating here. Like, like you, most people I know have a sports betting account and they can use their bank credit cards to make deposits. They can use their interact, all those kind of things. It's, we did, um, we did sports betting in this country. Like we did the legalization of marijuana, uh, in between being illegal and legal, we created this gray zone where we let people do it. Uh, and I don't mean just even in the case of marijuana, not even people use it. Like there were, there were a hundred stores operating in Toronto when marijuana was illegal. <laughs> so, so that was the that was the approach that that once through the intent to go legal was understood, they let this gray market flourish, and we've done the same thing kind of with with sports betting. So it's not completely new here. Like I know that a lot of those sites that people use in Canada, they were surprised that the FBI jams them in the U.S. Right, you can't just use your bank credit card and and you. But in Canada, that stuff. So, so it's not completely new. You've had, you know, people like uh, Bowman's, which I think is now. Bet 365. I mean, they were painted on the field in the CFL, Bowman's.com, 15 years ago. So there has been kind of this, you know, um, wink, wink quality to betting on the CFL, which is different than being able to partner with sports books, promote legalized sports betting. We didn't put it on Sports Center. We didn't put it on the pregame shows. We didn't talk about it in the broadcast. So it's a cultural shift, but not a completely new one. And it's funny. I was reaching for my phone and my battery just died, so I couldn't read it to you. But I was going to read you an example of on Saturday morning, I got a text from a friend of mine who was telling me about a friend of his, you know, a guy in his early 30s, not a traditional CFL fan. And he said he had a bet on the Lions last night and he watched every second of that game. And I, and I can guarantee you there's no chance he watches any of it 
if he's not betting on that game. Now, that's one guy. But the question is, how many people like that are there out there? And and I and I, I think it is. I think it, it's going to. It's one of the few ways I think that is going to engage younger viewers, which has been the CFL's age old problem. You know, how do we flip the demo? How do we stop being the fifty and overlay? Um, I think it's going to engage people. You know, in terms of it'll affect television ratings. You know, when you have a point spread on a game, it keeps people longer. I, I think overall, it is going to have an effect. In, and I and again, just anecdotally. I think there's a lot of examples of people like that that are thinking of the CFL. The, in, the betting information is better. You know, you can look at injury reports, and and it's and let's be honest, it's happening at a time when normally the first 10, 11 weeks of the CFL season happens before there's any meaningful college football or NFL. So you you know you've got a got a big window there where you can you can do that. Now, what is it going to mean money wise? You know, I spent some time trying to answer that question this summer. I talked to a lot of teams i've talked to a lot of people in the sports betting industry and i can tell you it's very very difficult to pin down because every market is specific uh, you've got the possibility of local deals you've got the you've got uh, league-wide deals nobody really knows what the sports betting environment is going to be like across all provinces because ontario is going to go and license private operators and sports books other provinces may keep it more provincial monopoly which is going to restrict their opportunities so nobody really knows all I can tell you is that teams, you know, kind of, I think, hoping that once we get to a fully evolved market, you know, not by October of 2021, but, you know, within a couple of years, as, as all of the regulations come out, as all of the participants come into the market, as sports bettors engage, that, you know, could be worth a million and a half to $2 million per team, all told. That's league deals and team deals. Now, I think that's probably an optimistic number. I don't know if it's a realistic number, but I think that's what the teams kind of hope for. But they're under no illusion that that's coming down the pike like this fall. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I think the the league understands, and the, the, the quest of the Canadian Football League over the last thirty years has been how do we tap new revenue streams? Okay, that's what produced U.S. expansion in nineteen ninety three. Where we've tapped out of revenue streams in Canada, what can we do in the U.S. Know, with television and franchise fees and other things that didn't work out so well it was a very poorly executed plan but that was the idea even randy ambrosi's cfl 2.0 bringing in global players that's ultimately in the hope that you can diversify the, the playing pool capitalize on the evolution of football as an international game which is a real thing you look at the evolution of the sport in you know japan and mexico and europe and ultimately, can you sell streaming rights, you know, in those countries? And I don't know if you can. Yeah, that's a big, I think there's some doubt about, you know, the ability to actually monetize that as long as you're just nine teams in Canada. But that's, that's what that's about, trying to tap new revenue streams. The conversation with the XFL, that was about trying to tap new revenue streams. Um, when marijuana became legal in 2017, I know the CFL had a lot of conversations about hoping to tap those as new revenue streams. Um, in the form of, uh, you know, public service message, right? That, that, that the idea was hopeful that a, that a marijuana company would be able to say, you know, X cannabis company and the Canadian Football League remind you that, uh, you know, when you consume cannabis, it's uh, four hours till you should drive and blah, 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 and, you know, stay healthy. Like, they wanted to be able to do those things. As the legislation came out, they found out you can't do that. Uh, you can't do anything, basically, when it comes to, you know, even sp anything that looks like sponsorship, uh, with a marijuana company that you're not allowed to do. So they, they weren't able to tap that. But I think they saw that. And I think their hope is still that maybe, what are we, four years into this, that somewhere down the road, those things kind of loosen, become a little more like the regulations around alcohol for advertising, and you would get a new revenue stream out of legal cannabis. They didn't get one as of yet. Um, and then that's what sports betting. Right? This is one where they say, okay, we believe this is a new category. We believe this is a new revenue stream. And it's a, and it's a, potential new revenue stream that also gives us a way to do what we've been fighting to do for the last 30 years. And that's engaged viewers that, that aren't traditional CFL fans, particularly younger ones. So I understand why they're jumping in on this one feet first. I understand why, you know, our guys are willing to talk about this on the broadcast. Now it is, I, you know, I think there's always, when you're talking about sports betting, uh, you know, there, there's always a bit of social responsibility that goes with it because we know there are people that struggle with it. Uh, but this is this is the new world. I mean, the uh, every sport is getting in on this, and I think the CFL has some advantages uh, they, uh, in comparison to other sports, which they don't always have. And those those advantages are the biggest one is the CFL plays football. They don't play soccer, play hockey, 
you know, I know people, some people love to bet on those sports, but I think we all know that, you know, a, a point spread in football is juicier, you know, than a, than a puck line, uh, you know, or a, or a soccer betting line for most people. So that's, that's a big advantage, you know, that they play a sport that the, that the, the point spread becomes part of the story. And I think they want it to be as much a part of the story as possible. People kind of, it's funny how people don't understand some of this stuff. Like I, you know, I expressed some concern about what happened with the BC Lions quarterback stuff on Twitter. And I said, look, I'll reserve judgment until we hear everything. But on the surface, you know, people were saying, well, the, the coaches shouldn't be making decisions based on what they think is best for the batters. No, that's not what anybody's saying. No one is saying that the coaches should be making lineup decisions based on, you know, what people are betting. On. What we're saying is the league is telling the teams to be as transparent as possible with who's playing because they, they don't want betters to be skittish about getting this information. No one is saying that decisions that the football team itself makes should be affected by the fact that we're in a legal betting environment and people may have bet on their game. Yeah, no, 100%. And uh, speaking of the U.S. expansion, the chat that you had on mm-hmm. CFL America, I'll give Greg a plug. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, fascinating deep dive, even for me as someone, you know, now that we have passed the XFL talks and all this stuff, but, but all of that, that deep dive into the 90s expansion, I thought was uh, fascinating. So that, that just a, a plug for anyone there. Um, I don't want to hold you too long. I do want to get you just your thoughts real quick on um, TV ratings, attendance. Um, I, I, I posted on our media, uh, social media, you know, people thought that, TV re- uh, ratings was kind of what they expected. Uh, you know, numbers wise, um, I, you know, I have them all here. Paul and I are going to talk about in the show today. Uh, general thoughts on either of those two things. It was funny because I saw the numbers in the U.S. were kind of the flip of Canada. Like they didn't do well on the Thursday night and they did well on the Saturday. And in Canada, they did well on the Thursday night and they didn't do so well on the Saturday. Um, I, I, look, I thought I think the number uh, was around 700,000 for the Thursday night in Canada, which Again, if you think of we're, we're a country that is you know, about one-tenth the size of the United States, so you can kind of translate that number basically as a multiple of 10. Um, if you compare 700,000, if you look at how many sporting events in Canada you know, get 700,000, it's not that many. You know? Um, you know, the Blue Jays will do those numbers when they're winning. Um, the Raptors you know, in the playoffs can do those, those numbers. Uh, Certainly, you know, hockey on a Saturday night in this country can do those numbers, but there aren't that many sporting events that just flat up can draw 700,000 numbers. So I thought it was a good number. Uh, I, you know, I, I, you, anytime you get Winnipeg, Saskatchewan into the games, and when those teams are good, I think you're, you, know, you get a strong number. Saskatchewan in particular, you know, on the Friday night against BC, again, a similar number uh, as you would expect. Uh, the, the Saturday night number was disappointing, but I think if you look at a number like that, and it was in the, the three to four hundred thousand uh, range. There's always, I think, you always look and say, "Well, what's the explanation?" Well, one, it was it was the Saturday night, the final night of the Olympics, and there were Canadians going for gold medals in those in the, on those nights. So I think that was a honestly, I I watched a fair amount of Olympics Saturday and taped and taped some of the CFL Saturday because I hadn't watched a lot of Olympics. So even me, you know, was 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 drawn into the Olympics at the same time some of the CFL was going. I bounce back a little. Um, and the Blue Jays were in the second half of a doubleheader against the Red Sox and make no mistake the Blue Jays are a big factor uh, when it comes to CFL ratings you know and it, we've seen it year in year out if the Blue Jays are out of it you know by June they have almost no effect on CFL ratings we, you know, it really clears the way for us to have a good year if they're in it and playing well and I think they've won 12 out of the last 15 right now as we speak um they they get a national audience. You know, the the Raptors fan base tends to go from about an hour east of Toronto to about an hour west of Toronto, and the Blue Jays fan base goes from Newfoundland to Vancouver. You know, like it to Victoria. It's it's right across the country. So that's that's a significant thing. So overall, I thought I thought the ratings were you know were decent. I thought the attendance was great. You know, we'll see where it is. I think is I'm curious to see where it's going to be in week number two because you know you have to see the novelty of the, of the opening game is gone, and then we'll see where it's going to be in a few weeks when the games move east. We'll also see how many people they're going to allow, be allowed to have in stadiums when they move east. Uh, you know the the, the Delta variant. Um, we seem to be in the early stages of the fourth wave here in Ontario right now. The, the cases of I just looked at the cases today. New cases five hundred and three, which is up. You know, a, a fair bit um, percentage wise from where we've been the last couple of weeks. So I think, you know, we'll wait and see whether they get to open the full stadiums in Ontario when they come back here 
the Argonauts are scheduled to play the first game in Southern Ontario on the 21st against Winnipeg, which is a week from this coming Sunday. So, but overall, I thought out of both those numbers, both in terms of attendance, presentation, TV numbers, all those things, it, it, it was a pretty good look and a pretty good return for the league on week number one. Yeah, it's it, even in Hawaii here, they just, like two days ago, they cut down all the numbers here again, you know, of, of, uh, capacity and all those sorts of things just while we've right. been here. So yeah. it's, it's, it's something. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough psychological game for people because every time you feel like you're past it, you know, all of a sudden we start getting dragged back in there and they haven't done that yet here, but I think people are starting to look, you know, a week or two ahead and, and wonder where we're going to be. Um, last thoughts before we go, um, you know, we, we touched on um, the Argos and, and the Lions. Any thoughts about the Alouettes, uh, Elks game or uh, the Tiger Cats, uh, Rough Riders before we go? Well, I, I, the, the Ticats and, and Rough Riders is going to be interesting for me because, you know, Hamilton was considered by most people. If you look at our previous show, most people picked them to win the Great Cup. And it's not shocking that they lost in week number one against Winnipeg because I, I think there were people that were surprised that, that Winnipeg were home underdogs in that game. But I think it's just how completely they were shut down on offense, you know, that they scored early and then not at all. And Jeremiah Mazzoli, you know, played – at an, an exceptional level in 2019 until he was hurt. You know, he was not, he didn't have a lot of time. He was throwing off his back foot the entire game there. They, I mean, they, they had two young tackles in that game going against two very good ends and a, and a really good defensive line in general. And actually front, front six, front seven for Winnipeg are, are, I think, you know, it's an elite group. So that showed up. Saskatchewan is also a very good defense and a very athletic defense and, and playing on the road. It, look, it would be the, you're looking for storylines that would kind of surprise people. I think Hamilton going 0 and 2 to open the season would be one. Even though both those games on the road in tough places, so you can understand why. Hamilton lost one regular season game after August 1st last year. Yeah, you know, and they lost that one game to Calgary by one point. Other than the Grey Cup, this was a team that was almost perfect through the through the second two thirds of the season. Uh, so. You know, that's and, and, then, and then you saw Saskatchewan scored all their points in the first half. So you had two teams that kind of struggled on offense last week. And I, I'm kind of interested to see which one kind of comes on, come, gets back on track. But a, a Hamilton 0 2 start would, would cause some buzz in the CFL. And, and in Montreal, uh, you know, this was the surprise team. You know, they were a 10 win team in 2019. They've kept a lot of players together. They've got a new general manager in Danny Machocha, who's really on their Canadians as, as relied highly on players, um, French Canadian players from schools in Quebec. And you look at their roster players, the university of Montreal, Laval university, lots of guys. Danny was the head coach at university of Montreal. So he knows a lot of those guys kind of reminds me a little bit of, you know, Steve Spurrier back in the day when he was coaching Washington and all these university of Florida guys were, were getting signed. Hope it works out better for, for them in Montreal than, than it did for him doing that. But, um, you know, they, they've kept their group of American receivers together. I think it's a very good group of receivers, uh, you know, Quan Bray and Eugene Lewis, Mary Al- Alford and um, Jake Wieneke and others. William Stanback coming back from the National Football League. You know, he, he was he was he, it, you don't see that many types of rushers in this league were really physical, like the kind of guys that defenders don't want to tackle because they hit you as hard as you hit them. Stanback is that kind of guy which is why he got an opportunity with Raiders in the NFL, because that's more of an NFL style running back than CFL style running back. But I think he, he really you know, presents a challenge for defenses. So I'm interested to see what he can do. And, you know, they, on the defensive side of the ball, the one thing Montreal really lacked in 2019 was they didn't much of a pass rush at all. Now they've signed some guys. It's always very difficult to evaluate you know, guys who played at high level U S college or spent some time in the national football league, especially when we haven't even seen them in preseason games. So there's a bit of an unveiling, I think for every team, because there's so many guys that are signed that we look at their resumes, we can watch their YouTube highlights, but how they're going to translate in the CFL. And that's one of the things I'll be looking for with Montreal and seeing, you know, can they spend a little more time off that defensive line in the opposing team's backfield? Because that was something they were really missing in 2019. Well, uh, it, it should be exciting. I, I feel glad the you know, football's back. It, it did feel very um, XFL like for me watching the games on my phone on demand. You know, be kind of living it through the weekend. I, I do like it easier to watch than the NFL, right? Where there's a million games every day, and so you're trying to. Figure, I mean, I do. I, I do really love that, and I think that it's going to. You know. Um, I just think it's going to be a fun, you know, season for everyone to, to cover, and I'm glad that we can be a part of that and, and have wonderful people like you on. I, I hope uh, it won't be another 53 weeks before we have you on again. So I, I appreciate your time today. 
Hey, my pleasure. I uh, look forward to doing this again sometime. Thank you so much. And we're back. I want to thank Dave Naylor for his time talking to Reed. Spent about 40 minutes with him as Reed sits on the beautiful shores of Hawaii. Which island are you on, Reed? Uh, we're in the Wahoo. We're downtown Waikiki at the Sheraton here. I will say uh, if you are planning a trip, worth the money to stay here. This has been, they got an infinity pool. We've got a private beach. We've got, you know, coffee in the room, drink score. So it's it's a good time here. I, if, if the Sheraton Waikiki wants to sponsor the Marquez, uh, the Wi-Fi could be better in the on the deck. So that's why I'm hotspotting on my phone. So you better Wi-Fi on the deck, but I think we should be good. Very cool stuff, man. Um, I'm definitely hoping to take my first trip out to Hawaii soon. So uh, hopefully I get something planned here now that I have someone who is into travel. She's very much into travel. If you've looked at her Instagram read, I don't know if you have. She's she's a traveling she's a traveling soul. She travels all the time. Also, also, you won't have to bring it. Uh, well, you'll, you'll have to pay for two full price adult tickets. You won't, you won't get a child discount with, the, with them. I know. I know. Uh, All right, moving anyway, on back to the uh, show. We're getting back. To, we're getting back on back back to things that that also matter. Um, per Rod Peterson, the Stamps have a new owner. Well, they have it. Yeah, they they have an interest in you. By this came out this week. Rod, of course, you know I I love Rod a lot. Um, he's like I, I, I'm not going to give you any details, but I guess that you know the Stamps have been quietly shopping a, an owner in, in the background for about the last year. And they feel like they found somebody. This was interesting. Um, Danny Austin, who um, covers the Stamps and the Calgary Flames and everything else. Uh, very, very upset about this. Uh, lots of Twitter beef this week about this. He was besmirching the XFL again. Danny Austin was about this. And it's just like, it's just not a good look for the CFL media. Like, Rod came out and said this, and that's fine. And you can say whatever. And like, Danny called him like a piss stain on the CFL. I mean, it was like really. Um, I just don't see you see like Ian Rappaport calling Tom Pelissero like a, a stain on. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's just a weird, like, I, I think that we need to be better than that about um, some of this stuff. But uh, any thoughts on the Stamps having a new owner? Well, I thought Canadians were nice to start. I thought they were polite people. What are we doing here? Um, I, You know, if the Stamps have a new owner, that's great. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what, if if Danny is upset about the Stamps having a new owner and, and, and who this new owner is, I have a general feeling that this new owner might be for an XFL collaboration no. <laughs> that's 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 the only suspicions i can start to to rumigate is like maybe this guy wants to join the xfl and danny's a little pissed about that hence why he started going off about the xfl again it's just weird you know um it's one of those things like uh just because you didn't get that info like just because i don't know something doesn't mean it doesn't exist right? right it's just it was just a weird thing where it's like well i don't know that like i haven't heard that and you're like well that's you know anyway it's, it's interesting we have sources I, this, people I'm, yeah, I, I'm throwing a little bit of shade here at, uh, at this, you know, they three down used this story about Brandon Banks showing up accidentally for practice on the day off. They were using it as like, oh, look at him. He's so hardworking. Right. Brandon Banks is showing up. Brandon Banks did not have a great home opener. He like threw the ball and hit the ref. He had the he, penalty against him. And then he showed up uh, at eight on Monday morning. He goes, I just showed up to work today. And I know we had the day off just ready to get my ass back to work and get better. Brandon, let's pay attention to when the practice is, buddy. Yeah. But I like your dedication. I do like your dedication. That's really cool. Your camera switched there, Paul. Is that okay? On it's the completely okay. It's completely okay. okay. I'm just made. I just want to make it. But anyway, no, I just thought, you know, I thought that was interesting that they were trying to say like, um, oh, this is such a hardworking guy. Like, no, he wasn't paying attention. Yeah. Like, no one practices. I don't know. I mean, sorry. Like, sorry to be like, read the buzzkill. But I was like, I think Brandon should. Uh, let's know. Let's know when practices. Well, I mean, okay. I disagree. I think I think it's it's dedication. I think it's dedication that he showed up to practice on a day he didn't have to show up to practice. We're talking about practice here. We're talking about practice, Reed. We're talking about practice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just, you know, let's know when the games are. Let's know when practice is. I don't know. I just thought that was weird. And it, especially where he came off kind of a lackluster first game performance, I would have been like, I don't know. I would, <laughs> I would have been paying attention to that. So Yeah. Hmm. I was gonna play a clip, but uh, you know, I don't. I have things wired differently, so I can't even play it's the clip. Okay. It's all right. Uh, 
uh, so we got this one Takiru Yamasaki. As I do that right, he is the first Japanese born player to score a point in the CFL. He, of course, plays for my BC Lions. Uh, it, it was it was a really tough though because he came out, he had the big field goal, everyone was excited, and then he missed like two more field goals that kind of cost him the game. So it's kind of one of those like it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Uh, in the NFL, you don't have this kind of failure rate and just keep your job. Like hopefully, hopefully he can turn it around and. Um, because if you left seven points on the field, that's rough. That is that that that's that's a that's changing the game. That's a, that's a yeah, that's a ask, win. Ask Taylor Russellino how that worked out for the Broncos when he came from the XFL and had that. Yeah, you know, he had played one game and it was like windy and he missed like two two PATs and they're like you're done. I mean yep. it's it's not you don't have that. Uh, but but it was the one thing I will say the the field goals. You know I guess it's the wider field and the hash marks. I mean it's like a diagonal kick. Hmm. It's interesting, yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's it's. I think it's like way more challenging, and then that makes sense. The rouge, the guys stand in the end zone. They like, but like the you you know, you have a receiver back to like catch that field goal. If they miss it. I mean, it's kind of a weird dynamic. I kind of like it, but it is weird the first time you see it. Like, like they're kicking like sideways down the field. So interesting. Uh, a couple got engaged at the Blue Bombers home opener. Want to congratulate uh, Brenda O'Gracek and Trevor Bourgeois. Uh, they're from Brandon. I assume that's in uh, Manitoba. Uh, they got engaged via the Drummeltron at IG Field. With the ma- help of mascots, Buzz and Boomer, uh, O'Grace had got down on one knee and asked her partner, Bourgeois. Oh, she asked him. Yeah. yeah wow. That's why it's interesting. Oh. Take a hint, Trevor. Take a hint. Why uh, don't you yeah. like Michael Scott in the office and stop her from proposing and then propose yourself, Trevor? What are you doing? Uh, I thought that was interesting. Also, Dorothy is all in on the Blue Bombers. That is her team. We said that last week, mm-hmm. but Dorothy is very much a Winnipeg because uh, of because of the W and the colors. And even <laughs> though they're not the UW Huskies, she is a big Husky or a big Winnipeg Blue Bomber fan. Looks like the Toronto Argonauts had some charter issues, according to Michael King. Uh, OWG Voyages is the flight that we're not taking. Well, at least I'm not taking up to uh, the Grey Cup. Uh, ended up taxiing back to the apron last night. Um, and then they, I guess they had some issues with the plane and well, this was them getting that. Yeah. The tweet was from um, them, you know, trying to get uh, home from the game on Saturday, but I just thought that I couldn't imagine like trying to fly out and then you're like the charter plane had to come back. It seemed like they were at the airport for quite a while. I just thought that was kind of a funny thing. Uh, your, your boy, you love this guy, uh, Canadian NFL analyst, Nate Burleson. He's Canadian. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't analyze Canadian football, but he is Canadian. Uh, he's a former wide receiver and he is uh, moving on to CBS this morning. Interesting. I didn't know that Nate Burleson was Canadian. That's fascinating. I, mean, I knew he played in, in Seattle I, and, and mm-hmm. for the Vikings and the Lions. I had no idea he was he was uh, Canadian. I didn't either. With his Kung Lao hats and everything like that, he is making the move from the NFL Network over to CBS this morning. Uh, probably going to be dropping his duties with the extra. He does the extra TV show as well. He'll show up on there every like once or twice a week doing stories for them. But uh, definitely this is a great thing to see these former players like Michael Strahan and – uh, Nate Burleson get this uh, opportunity uh, after football and you know they're great people on the field but they've also shown a great acumen for not being like normally when when you have a former person you know, have a per- former player you fit them in a box and you put them in this like oh you can only cover sports and it's good to see people like Michael Strahan and Nate Burleson get an opportunity to be like beyond that so Congrats to Nate for getting a new job. Please lose the Kung Lao hats. They're annoying. Yeah, I, yeah just tremendous that way. Uh, a couple other last notes here, and then I do have a funny story before we get off here. I'm going to share with you about Dorothy, uh, about the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Uh, Josh Davis has an interview uh, with the director. of the, the, That new AAF documentary came out this week, you know, the Fire Fest, all that stuff. I'm going to watch it next week. Obviously, we've been in Hawaii, and if I told Dorothy, like, oh, yeah, I'm, we're gonna, I'm going to watch the AAF documentary, you know, Alliance is Broken, that probably wouldn't go over. No. But uh, if you are interested in that, I know that Josh had a interview with the director, and that I believe he has a couple of interviews coming up uh, with some of the players, you know, from that documentary. But uh, really, I know uh, Seth, friend of the show, was uh, watching it. Uh, XFL Reddit was was watching it. The people over there. So, uh, but if you are into that, it's on Amazon and Apple TV now. You can watch that. Uh, Alliance is broken. The AAF documentary. Very cool. New England Patriots uh, had five players in for workouts on Thursday. One of them is Jordan Tamu from the That's Battle Hawks. Very exciting. Wouldn't it be interesting if? If Tamu actually got some playing time um, this year, wouldn't that be interesting? And I don't know. Do the, do the Patriots play Washington football team? 
Uh, I don't know. All I know is I think it's week four. They play the Buccaneers. I'm not sure if you knew that, that week four, the Buc- I mean, cause that's all they talk about right now. I didn't know if you know that the Buccaneers are going to go play at the Patriots and uh, people are very, very excited about that. Well, game. here's an interesting thing. If, if Tamu gets uh, signed to any sort of deal, the first preseason game for the New England Patriots is against Washington it's football today. team. Oh, that's today? That's the 12th? Yeah, that's today. I think it's today. Uh, yeah, well, then today. he's not going to get so signed. I don't think Jay Jay's Womp, womp, womp. Uh, one last note here. Uh, speaking of Washington football, speaking of the XFL, friend of the show, <laughs> Cole Boozer, we talked a couple uh, weeks ago. He announced his retirement when he got, you know, he didn't make it on to the Alouettes. Uh, it was the best of times again. It was the worst of times. They they announced that Washington football had signed Cole as a as a tackle, I believe. Uh, and then uh, we were all excited. Everyone was going crazy off the walls. You know, we had the photo of him getting signed, all that. Literally the next day, he was on the practice field for five minutes. They walked him off and they waved him. Man, do you have any insight? Five minutes. Five minutes, and that was it. Uh, yeah, Josh Davis talked with Cole. Uh, you know, yeah, I think he maybe just is set on retirement, right? Maybe he got back out there and, and, um, it it seems like it was a mutual decision because when I first heard about it, I thought, oh my God, Cole went out there and like injured himself, maybe didn't look or or didn't look great. Or maybe, I don't know what the protocol is. If you got to whatever. And, and I thought, Oh my God, this is, and, but it sounds like it's mutual. And, and, and Cole, I think is pretty set on retirement. So, uh, but you know, God, I was, I was off the wall. I said, we're going to the Super Bowl when they, when they hired, when they signed Cole, I thought we're, 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 we're set on the ring, but uh, we'll see. Man, unfortunate news, not nonetheless. And, uh, we hope Cole has a great transition into his post football career. Cause it's clear that he's probably done, you know, playing at this point. So, yeah. Also, uh, it's real quick. Uh, so I have a story, but we uh, and then we're also. I, I think I texted you this week. I know you've been busy at work. Wow. Uh, the the ticketing agent for the Washington Football Team follows us now on Twitter. So, I mean, if Washington Football does really well, we might have to do like a DC show. Look if we this, can get like like group VIP tickets. Listen to this guy. I'm all in. I'm all in. He wants football. to do live shows uh, all the time now. So, uh, here's a funny story before we go. So we were talking about Dorothy. She's a Winnipeg Blue Bomber fan, all this kind of stuff, right? So we're staying in our hotel. It's like 30 floors up, right? There's all these railings. So uh, about row, like 25 floors up, there's a Wazoo flag, Washington State University, right? Dorothy's in-state rivals, right? Yeah, hanging from, from the rail. And so Dorothy and I saw this from the pool the other day, and she goes, what the hell is this cougar flag? You know, what, 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 what this so tacky, what idiot would post that? So she goes, well, I'm going to go, you know, get my phone and we're going to take, so like the next day we're out there and it's still, she's just incredulous. She goes, I can't believe this flag's out here. And so she goes, it gets her phone. She goes into the pool and she's, you know, taking a photo and this guy goes, Oh, what are you, are you, are you trying to find your room? She goes, no, I'm trying to take a photo of this stupid wasu flag that this idiot has hanging up. He goes, Oh, that's, that's my flag. Like we try, I travel with that. I always hang it up in my hotel room. What wasu flag travels with a Washington? Like that's crazy. Dude, there is, I don't know if you know this, but on ESPN game day, uh, the Saturday morning pregame college show that they run like for three hours. There is a Wazoo flag. It's called Old Crimson that flies every single week. This group gets it and sends it to the next and and one one Wazoo alum or someone that's close receives the package, straight starts hanging it and flying it all over the place every single uh, ESPN game day. I'm I'm not kidding. Tell Dorothy that <laughs> she goes. I was dying. That was that was the highlight of Washington. But she, anyway, we're all in on Winnipeg. We're all in. We're all in on BC Lions. So uh, anyway, that's all I got today. Very cool. We want to thank you for joining us. We want to thank Reed for uh, you know taking time out of his beautiful scenic vacation. Oh, you know Dorothy's asleep right now. She's probably going to get up pretty soon. They're probably going to go. Uh, I don't know. Sit on the beach and drink hard seltzer. You know. Whatever they are, Trulies, Claws, whatever. They have Kona. I think we're drinking Kona hard seltzer. Koa hard seltzer? Kona. Like, you know, they have Kona coffee. I think it's oh. Kona hard seltzer. They have that out there? It's like, tro- they have like Pog. It's like Pog flavored. It's good. Pog flavored? Like, what do you mean Pog flavored? Like the Pog? Like passion orange guava. Oh, not like the Pog that used to throw down and like yeah. knock out of the circle. <laughs> I'm going really yeah, deep okay. with my youth. Get there. my slammer. Yeah. My slammer. <laughs> oh, look, my slammer is like four inches thick. Bam. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm done. I'm done joking about Gen X, Gen Y stuff. 
Uh, we want to thank you all for joining us, and uh, we will see you next week. Thank you.